Long term, we don't know what the non-responders are going to be. We don't know what the relapse is going to be. We don't know how to predict. <laughs> Dentistry's role, as I've mentioned, dentist, obstructive sleep apnea is a life-threatening medical disorder. We are not competent or legally allowed to diagnose and treat. We are allowed to supply appliances on the recommendation of a physician. Diagnosis must be made by a physician. If you're choosing to make sure the patient has a face-to-face -face with a sleep physician before you do anything, I think that's the highest level of care. If we reach the point where either you can't get the physician in or economically, you're at least doing a sleep study which is being reviewed by a board-certified sleep physician, legally you can do that. Determination will be made in the next couple of years whether we can uh, continue to do that. So. We should screen and refer patients. We should treat on referral from the physician. We should monitor and treat potential side effects. And we should do follow-up. American Academy of Sleep Medicine, diagnosis by a physician. And these appliances are for primary snoring after sleep issues have been ruled out. Selected patients with the lower levels of obstructive sleep apnea, lower AHIs, CPAP intolerance or unwillingness, and um, contraindications for any of the surgeries they may want. We should fit the appliance, we should follow up, and work under the uh, auspices of our physicians. Uh, primary snoring, my, the thought I'd throw out, if you're going to treat on the referral from a physician that's never, for, re, never seen your patient simply because he's reviewed a sleep study, who do you turn to for complications? If that physician is in South Georgia or Marietta and I'm in Swanee, how do I handle the complications and the unraveling of the central sleep apnea? Um, con we are contraindicated for first line treatment of severe apnea and anything related to central apnea. CPAP is the gold standard. Uh, we need to comply with our local goal, our local requirements. We need to check with our insurance companies, make sure it, that we are following their guidelines. You have a problem and you've stepped outside the board's guidelines, you're not covered by your dental insurance, you are liable. Um, we know that some's physician, some of it is our bailiwick. Screening. You can screen existing patients, give a sleep questionnaire, and use a basic sleep monitor to pull up the patients out of your practice. What you're going to see, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, is what everyone uses. It's a bunch of questions that are asked, uh, what, eight, eight questions, you grade them on zero to three, you have a potential high score of 24 for someone that has massive sleep apnea, Anything other than over 10 is considered indications of sleep apnea. Everybody undergrades themselves. Everybody undergrades themselves. So if someone says they're a 10 and you would actually go through this in detail, they would be higher. The, here's a sleep questionnaire from Dr. Larry Tilley up in Calhoun that some of you all know. This is the basic. Epworth sleepiness scale, and then there are some other questions on the second page. Patients know how to score themselves, so you don't have to do a thing. I would recommend having some basic, uh, basic screening monitors in the office, I'll go over several later, and have every one of your hygienists have this two-page questionnaire ready to give your patients. It's the best way to make them self-aware. Physicians will tend to use what they call the stop bang questionnaire. At least be familiar with what it is. These are the questions they're going to ask the patient to determine if they're a candidate for sleep apnea treatment or for at least sleep studies. Don't memorize it, just know, please, that if your physician refers to it, that's what you're looking at. Uh, medical history and physical exam in the dental office. Ask the patient about snoring, how loud it is, how much it affects the wife, whether it's going up and down, whether there are quiet periods, indication, indicative of apnea. Daytime drowsiness. Many people don't understand that as drowsy and fatigued as they are is not the way most people live. We all live in a, in a universe of one, our own. We don't see that what, what for us is normal may not be reality for, the, for most of the in, uh, 
most of the population. Uh, we have cognitive impairment, uh, motor vehicle accidents, a lot of uh, emphasis being put on truck drivers these days, long haul truck drivers to make sure that their sleep is screened. And you will start to see more patients because of that requirement. Quality of sleep, how many times the patient tells you they wake, usual sleep positions, whether they snore in all positions or only on their back. Patient history, additional information, uh, all this we've gone over, hours of sleep, blood pressure, uh, dry mouth, TMJ problems, bruxism, sleepiness, gain in weight, nasal congestion. History of previous sleep disorders, how they were treated. History from the bed partner. Your bed, the person's bed partner is going to be more accurate at diagnosing a sleep problem than the actual patient will be. Dr. Jeff Rouse tells us that these are the people that are going to be more prone to, uh, to obstructive sleep apnea. Perio patients, because they have, they have a greater inflammatory response and the airway tissues, therefore, will be more uh, inflammatory, inflammation prone. Facial type, obviously class two, vertical growers, adenoidal facies are going to be snorers and our sleep apnea patients. Obesity and GERD, bruxing kids, they're trying to maintain their airway. Tongue thrust, they're trying to maintain their airway. Airway compromised kids, tonsils and adenoids. Again, from Dr. Rouse, here's something that we'll spend some time on. Upper airway resistance syndrome is slightly different from obstructive sleep apnea. But also look for non-compliant night guard patients. They say, hey, I can't, I can't breathe with this in. You're probably aggravating the sleep apnea by treating the bruxism when the bruxism is a result of the sleep apnea. Uh, daytime bruxers, pregnancy-induced obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disordered breathing, very common. So a lot of these women, you'll either do an appliance for or have them sleep um, semi-reclined, not laying on their back. Gaggers and those with huge tongues. The folks that we're dealing with upper airway resistance syndrome, and these are going to be a lot of your failures in sleep, in sleep appliance therapy that you don't know what's going on if you don't have a study or a monitor that will help you pick up RERAs. They have a more collapsible upper airway. Upper airway, not obstructed, lower airway. More responsive patient airway. It's more reactive. It, more rapid recovery. Frequent sympathetic system activation, pumping out the adrenaline. Frequent fight or flight with increased pulse rate blood pressure, respiration. So <clears throat> obstructive sleep apnea versus upper airway resistance syndrome. OSA, you have a high number of apneas and hypopneas because you're obstructing the airway. But few raras. In the UARS, you have fewer, relatively fewer apneas and hypopneas, but much more raras. These events where people are struggling to breathe, it's not an apnea or hypopnea, but, it's, but there's much greater resistance. In the sleep patient, you're going to see oxygen desaturation below 92%. For these uh, resistance patients, you don't obstruct that much. The oxygen saturation stays high. These tend to be male overweight. These tend to be male, female slender. Here it's airway anatomy. There it's hormonal, postmenopausal, very common. Bottom line, OSA, obstruction. Upper airway resistance, resistance. Again, the difference, obstruction, resistance. Here people are going to say they're sleepy. Here people are going to say, I'm fatigued, I'm anxious, uh, I'm depressed. And diagnosis is with the sleep study. Here, because we're not measuring raras, the diagnosis is often missed. High number of apneas, fewer raras. High number of raras. And... Uh, so they may have a, a high RDI because you're measuring the apneas, but your raras are going to be what give you your indication of resistance. Here is a parasympathetic response. There's a sympathetic response. People with obstructive sleep apnea are going to tend to wake, not knowing they've, wake, they've been awake or aroused, go back to sleep. 
The upper airway resistance, your middle-aged female, is going to wake with such a strong sympathetic response, she's not going to go back to sleep. Big difference between the two, very confusing if you're not aware. Someone asked me before how you determine a RERA. Okay, normal breathing, this is your inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. Fairly balanced curves with a reasonable peak. When you have upper airway resistance syndrome, you're dealing with RERAs where your resistance is greater. So you're going to see this curve that should normally go up is flattened and your expiratory phase is about three times as long. So normal resistance with a flattened peak and longer expiration. Here's an obstructive hypopnea where you obstruct and you're getting a little bit of airflow. Obstructive apnea, you're obstructing and getting no airflow. You'll need to, when you're looking at the data on your sleep studies, you'll need to recognize the difference of those and not just work from the numbers. OSA and resistance, are, they all cause arousals from fragmented sleep, REM sleep disruption, OSA, repeated arousals, but they return to sleep. Upper airway resistance, they wake with a lot of heart pumping, adrenaline, and cortisol, and they often, they're, they're awake for the night, they're not going back to sleep. Um, they all, they both sensitize the nervous system to pain. There's increased clenching and bruxism, either to maintain the airway or as a reaction to the arousals. No one has quite yet definitively said it one, runs in one direction or the other. There is muscle spasm and pain, anxiety, depression, headache, irritable bowel and colitis, and chronic fatigue syndrome associated with both. On both entities, you need to maintain a patent airway, CPAP, appliance. Be aware that this is not your usual weight-dependent and not position-dependent patient. Female, not male, 